Coming in for the very first time, you should know that we do this every Thursday night. In fact, we call it Thursday nights at the museum because of that, because we do it every Thursday night at 7.30. So every Thursday night, we're uh, this throughout the fall, we're offering a little chat. Uh, we had a poetry reading a couple weeks back. We've got a live talk show in two weeks on November 5th. And next week, we have a special conversation co-presented with KGNU, KGNU Community Radio on the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, moderated by Maeve Conran. You'll want to tune in for that. That's going to be a really terrific program. I want to thank all those people who make this these programs possible at the Longmont Museum, our media sponsor, KGNU, our museum members, donors, the friends of the Longmont Museum, and the scientific and cultural, scientific and cultural facilities district. Without your support, we simply can't do all that we do, and we do a whole heck of a lot, even during a pandemic. Anyway. If you're interested in learning more about the museum and about membership and how you can support the Longmont Museum, please visit our website at longmontmuseum.org. Now for this evening's program. As an apocalyptic plume of smoke from the nearby historic wildfires descends upon us here in Longmont, it's almost impossible now, at least for me, to turn back the clock and recall how we started out this year, 2020. I can remember in the lead up to it thinking that perhaps this might be the year of clarity, you know, 2020 vision. The year where we could collectively take a good long look at ourselves in the mirror and see clearly who we are as a society, warts and all. But it seems as if 2020 had other plans on top of historic political polarization, including an impeached president, economic inequality, climate change, and the tragic death of one of my basketball heroes, Kobe Bryant, we were met with a pandemic, followed by mass employment, even more polarization, rampant and baseless conspiracy theories, the high profile, and high profile and unjust police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, and others, followed by historic protests, some violence, the death of Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a highly contentious Supreme Court nomination, and wildfires. What's next? Plague? Oh, no, I'm counting that one twice. Yes, we've already, we've, we've got that, don't we? Truth, whatever that is, certainly does seem, at least right now, to be stranger than fiction. To help us manage this deluge of strange reality, we've assembled a trio of novelists to weigh in on just how strange things have actually become. Erica Krauss, all the way down there on your left, is the author of two books of fiction. Her novel, Contenders, was a finalist for the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award and has been translated into German. Her short story collection, Come Up and See Me Sometime, won the Patterson Fiction Award, was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and is translated into six languages. Erica's fiction has been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Esquire.com, Plowshares, One Story, The Canyon Review, Alaska Quarterly Review, The Iowa Review, Glimmer Train, Story, Boulevard, Crazy Horse, and Shannon, Shenandoah. Her short stories have been shortlisted for Best American Short Stories, Best American Non-Required Reading, and the Pushcart Prize. Erica has also published poetry and essays in magazines such as Granta.com and reviewed for The New York Times Book Review. Two new books are forthcoming with Flatiron Books, Tell Me Everything, Memoir of a Private Eye, and Save Me, a collection of short stories. Tell Me Everything was optioned by, uh, for television by Playground Entertainment. Publication dates for both books are to be announced. Erica went to middle school and high school in Japan and earned her BA from Grinnell College. She earned her MA in English, and English Literature and Creative Writing right here at CU Boulder where she's taught creative writing classes. She teaches and mentors at the Lighthouse Writers Workshop in Denver and is a winner of the Lighthouse Beacon Award for Teaching Excellence. She has taught at the Himalayan Writers Retreat in Uttarakhand, India, and teaches yearly at the Grand Lake Retreat in Grand Lake, Colorado. Glad you're not teaching there right this second. <laughs> she has won fellowships and scholarships to the Longleaf Writers Workshop, Bread Loaf Writers Workshop, Sewanee Writers Workshop, and the inaugural Amtrak residency. Erica lives in Boulder, which in case you didn't know, it's just about 20 minutes down that way. 
Erica T. Uh, oh, and Daniel Levine in the center there. He is the author of Hyde, a retelling of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from the villain's perspective. Daniel studied English literature and creative writing at Brown and received his MFA in fiction in writing from the University of Florida. He has taught composition and creative writing at high schools and universities, including the University of Florida, Montclair State University, and Metropolitan State College of Denver. Originally from New Jersey, he also lives in Boulder. Erica T. Worth's publications include two novels, Crazy Horse's Girlfriend and You Who Enter Here, two collection of two collections of poetry, and a collection of short stories, Buckskin Cocaine. A writer of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, she teaches creative writing at Western Illinois University and has been a guest writer at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in numerous journals, including Boulevard, The Writer's Chronicle, Waxwing, and The Kenyon Review. She is a Kenyon Review Writer's Workshop Scholar, attended the Tin House Summer Workshop, and has been chosen as a narrative artist for the Meow Wolf Denver installation. She is Apache, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and was raised outside of Denver. Um, please welcome our authors to the Longmont Museum, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. Thank you, very small, socially distanced audience. Hello, Internet. Um, we're going to have each of our authors this evening read a little bit from their work, and we're going to start off with Erica Krauss, otherwise known as Erica K this evening. We're Erica number one. <laughs> it can get confusing with the two Ericas. Thank you so much for having us, Justin. Thank you for everybody who's uh, tuning in for spending time with us instead of um, Donald Trump tonight. So I'm going to read from a short story that came out in a really great literary magazine called Glimmer Train that just closed. So this is their last issue. Um, but I'm blind, so I'm going to read from paper. So the um, short story is called North of Dodge. My high school voted me most likely to leave Dunfield. So a week after graduation, I stole my uncle's station wagon and did just that. It's not a felony so long as you stay in Nebraska. I drove 300 miles to Omaha, where I was supposed to begin college in the fall, and parked at Leavenworth Street for breakfast. The car was stolen again by the time I left the diner, but I didn't care. My uncle was a dick, and all I needed was the ride out. Can I swear? Can I swear? Uh, I, I believe so. Facebook, is that OK? Yes. OK, great. Um, OK. Uh, when you steal a car from a white supremacist, the safest place to stay is in a black area of town. I asked a gas station attendant wearing a Confederate flag t-shirt what parts of Omaha white girls should avoid, and he said north of Dodge Street. So that's where I went, far away from the likes of him. As I marched north, my backpack chugged its own rhythm. This is your chance, this is your chance. It was a Sunday morning. At that moment, my uncle would be preaching his new sermon. You better get right or get left. North of Dodge, I felt conspicuous in my white skin, guilty. Torn corrugated metal siding drooped off storefronts. Clammy hands scrawled flyers for lost dogs and children peeled from the sides of buildings. The occasional breeze smelled like cat sex and exhaust. Aluminum foil covered the insides of the windows to deflect the sun, which was mostly a suggestion of brightness in an otherwise gray day. By afternoon, I found a place to rent from a flyer staple gun to a telephone pole. The apartment manager said I looked sweet and honest, and that's what I am, except honest. I paid with the majority share of my uncle's cash, a bonus I had found in his glove box under an unopened box of expired condoms. My new apartment was one musty room at basement level off Ames Avenue next to a parking lot I later voted parking lot most likely to have one abandoned woman's shoe on the ground. First I found a white sandal, then a royal blue pump with glitter. I collected the shoes as they appeared, wondering if they were evidence. I lined them in my windowsill as a reminder not to leave the windows open while I slept. The former tenant had left behind a mattress, table, lamp, and a vinyl chair I slid around in at night, greased by my own sweat. No air conditioning or fan. On the sticky table, I found a notebook and three pens. I figured the notebook was a kind of gift, so I started writing in it every night before bed. I mostly wrote about how scared I was. I had never lived by myself before or worked a job besides cleaning my uncle's church and the annex we lived in. I didn't feel safe outside my apartment and less so inside at night. I couldn't find any job openings in my new neighborhood, hardly any businesses even. 
When I walk down the street, men roll down their windows to flap a wad of bills at me and ask, how much? I wondered if it might come to that. I didn't know how I would survive on my own, let alone go to college in the fall or ever or get the chance to be someone to anyone. Shortly after I moved in, I was fretting my notebook when two voices giggled at my window. My heart stuttered in fright, but they were just children, two of them. In the dim light reflected from my lamp, one of them was chubby in the face, his lips curling into the fat of his chin, maybe 10 years old. His spectacular afro reminded me of those disc-like halos in medieval art. The white boy was skinny like an ermine with curly, matted hair that might be blonde under the dirt. He looked much younger than the big one, who said, we're going to rape you. Yeah, the smaller one said, rape you. They laughed. Can we come in? Hell no, I said, and don't talk to me like that. I'm going to break into your house and steal your TV then, the big one said, but he could see I didn't have one. You got a man? He's in the bathroom. No way. We've been watching you. You ain't got no man there. I stood to shut the window, and they scattered, afraid of me. So I left the sash open and returned to my notebook, vowing to buy curtains, catching whatever breeze they weren't blocking. They had already crept back like squirrels made brave from hunger. How old are you guys, I asked. What are your names? They grinned, flattered by my interest. The little blonde one said, Six. I'm Kyle. I'm six. He's ten. He's, a, he's Jarvis. Jarvis said, I'm twelve. Kyle said, He's ten. My dick's about from here to here. You're six, I asked. Jarvis told Kyle, Ah, you got an itty-bitty dick. Kyle told Jarvis, Hey, that's your mom's shoe. That's your mom's shoe, Jarvis said, and they laughed, high-pitched like jackals. She hates me, Kyle said. I couldn't tell which mother Kyle was talking about, Jarvis's or Kyle's own. It seemed inconceivable that anyone could hate a six-year-old, that there would be anything to hate yet. Jarvis asked, What are you writing? I'm writing down the things you're saying, I said. Why? Kyle asked. They're interesting. We're interesting! They tried to high-five each other but missed and got embarrassed. Jarvis's nose formed a sharp triangle when he laughed. I wrote in my notebook, most likely to do crime for someone else's crime. Little Kyle said, picking his nose, I went to jail for drugs. I busted out. Then, I'm going to bust in here when you're asleep. I began to get unrealistically nervous again until Jarvis said, No way, not with these high windows. You knock into everything, it would be dark. You wouldn't be able to find a lamp. You'd bump into a heater and burn your feet. Then he said to me, Send him home. He should go to jail. Kyle told me, I love you. Jarvis said, I'm sorry for him. You're pretty. In the tits. Give me back my mama's shoe. Please, ma'am. The ma'am shocked me even more than the rest of it. Jarvis had to point twice at the blue pump before I popped open the screen to hand it to him through the crack. He grasped it so gently, all I felt was a lightness in my hand as the shoe and the children returned to the darkness of the streets. I know it goes on, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Daniel, would you like to share something with us? Yes, please. Um... So I've been working uh, on a novel, just a big, monstrous literary sci-fi thing. Um, and recently I took a break to write some short stories that were kind of like pandemic stories. Um, so this is just a little bit from one of these pandemic stories that um, I wrote. I don't think it needs any more context. The small hour. It was their honeymoon, or supposed to be, but with the virus, this was the best they could do, a big old colonial in the countryside. On VRBO, it had looked quaintly elegant, but now in the dead of night, stricken with dread beside her sleeping husband, she was fairly certain it was haunted. The many-windowed brick manse set back on an overgrown hill ringed by woods, had seemed to turn toward their approach up the steep drive earlier that afternoon, slowly exposing the parked car and then the man, stepping from the side porch with a cardboard box in his arms, not wearing a mask. Clearly he had been going in and out of the place with his naked face, breathing into the rooms, and despite their Audi's protective seal, her sternum had tensed in self-defense. Her husband, she still wasn't used to thinking the word, was trying to do so whenever she could, to inure herself. Press the ignition button, 
and the engine whirred off. And for a second, she imagined they had flown here in their noiseless craft from the future and would remain safe so long as they kept out the toxic air of the present. Wait, she nearly said, as her husband looped his mask over his ears and reached for the handle. She had caught his grimace, like this was a mission to be completed before they could return home. Then the door was open and the hot, riotous afternoon swarmed in. The owner, that's who he was. She recognized his face off the profile pic on the website in the moment before he donned his own mask, was gratuitously pretty for this rustic setting, like their silver sedan, a svelte, shave-headed man with an indeterminable accent. Above the robin's egg blue, his eyes were long-lashed and lingering. Trees crowded the stone-shingled roof. Crickets shrilled. The window sills were flaking paint. No one's rented this place in years, she thought, with a slither of fear, in spite of the dozen reviews. Yikes, a trap. VRBO says I gotta use the spray, he said, as he led them into the porch entrance. She looked at her husband to see if he would stop the owner from coming inside, though it was obviously too late to keep the house's atmosphere sacrosanct. I used it twice, so if it smells a little, a little disinfectanty, that's just the spray. It was unlike Carl, she thought now, lying next to him in the huge master bed in the dark, not to say anything, like, we can take it from here, thanks, or we're trying to minimize contact, or even more aggressively, did I just see you inside without a mask on? Her husband never had a problem establishing boundaries about the virus, even from the beginning of the outbreak. Excuse me, he would say sharply to people in the grocery store who stood too close behind them in line. When the lawn crew started moving the patio furniture from their pool the way they always did, beefy dudes with beer guts and grass-flecked arms who clearly thought this whole thing was being blown out of proportion, he had gone out in his polo shirt with spare gloves and told the men to put them on, then tugged up his own mask to indicate they should wear theirs over their noses, please. Even her parents, at their makeshift backyard wedding, he was firm, halting them mid-stride. Sorry, guys, we're still not doing the hugging thing. <laughs> so it was a surprise to see him trail the owner into the house without any reprimand. But this honeymoon had been his idea and she could tell he didn't want to cast ripples in the halcyon plan so soon, as much for her sake as his own pride, for she was squeamish about confrontation and was touched by his consideration, even as she wished for his usual assertiveness. So she remained on the driveway, torn in the trilling afternoon, as he followed the owner inside. The rooms were large and sparse and low-ceilinged, antique furniture, decrepit, and placed in odd corners. In the pictures online, the effect had been country chic, emphasizing the sleek, modern kitchen, but in person, the hardwood was scuffed, the Victorian sofas dented and stained as if former residents had died of consumption upon them. She watched Carl's eyes over the rim of his mask as he took it in. In this new age they were living through, she'd become expert at examining the upper portion of people's faces. The startled snapshot between the bridge and brow that the rest of the face couldn't compensate for any longer. Eyes too bulbous or narrow or sunken or dull were presented as on a microscope slide, darting inescapable. Carl's were a nice color, cornflower blue. They'd seem mischievously attractive when they first met at a potluck offset by his wry mouth. But reduced by the mask she'd found these last restrictive months, they appeared suspicious and severe, the eyes of the efficiency expert, which indeed he was, pruning everything down to essentials. At Whole Foods or Target, she would see him scanning the space as if deciding which shoppers were superfluous, too fat, too slow, too incautious, too stupid, a drain on the rest of the system. What, he would demand, muffled, when he found her staring at him 
with what must have been misgiving in her own deer and headlight gaze. And there was guiltiness in the accusing question, annoyance at having been caught in his calculations. In the zombie apocalypse, or whatever the mayhem this pandemic eventually turned into, Carl would be the guy with the sniper rifle, picking off heads one by one. He would thrive. Thank you, Erica. I'm going to read um, a very short piece from my collection, Buckskin Cocaine, um, which is about the Native American um, film world. Um, and it's just different personalities. This is one of them Gary Hollywood. The Red Grasses. That's what I remember. Threading my little brown hands through them on the hills in Oklahoma, my mother calling in Cherokee from the warm little cabin in the distance. The smell of smoking meats. It was so beautiful, but the memory is even more beautiful. Even then, I knew I was born for blood. When I drink, I drink for the pain. I drink because I can because there is so much blood filling my heart, it's spilling over, I trip on the slick of it. Years ago, years before all of the lights filling my eyes, over and over, the images of me up there for everyone to see, I went to war. We all went to war then. We went because we thought we had to. Warrior, 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 the blood said. But when I left Byron behind in the jungle, I knew what I was. It was then that I first thought about my dying. There were times that I thought I could hide in anger, in anger at this country, the things that it had done, the things that it was doing, the people in charge on every reservation in urban Indian ghettos and Indian territories. I was so angry, it was wonderful. It fed the blood. I remember those days on the Oglala reservation. We were powerful in those dark hills. We were everywhere like lights, like fireflies, which I've heard are disappearing now, like the bees. People died there. That fed the blood, too. On the screen, I am terrifying. I am so terrifying that it is utterly beautiful, make no mistake. And I feel like someone should be proud. Look at me up there, my hair so black, my naked chest so brown, my eyes filled with stones. I look like a warrior. I dance, I sing, I fight. I am so beautiful in the dark. The dark is where I live. God, it's so cold. When I was a child, my mother would hold me in her long brown arms and rock me in the big wooden rocking chair and sing me to sleep with songs in Cherokee by the little black stove. Dad would come in from work on the ranch and he would smell like big wild animals and dust, like red, red dust. I was half asleep and I could feel her chest rumble as she spoke. Everything was so warm, so beautiful. Can't I go back? I'm always trying. I want to say that I've done good things. I have done a lot of good things. I have helped bring our language back. There are things in our words that are not anywhere else in this wide green world, I know that. There is so much I refuse to leave behind, to lose. I have fought on those red hills. I have fought in the Badlands. I have lost things. But there is so much that I lost before I was even born. The good things sometimes justify the bad. Sometimes everything is a song, a bird's wing song, quiet so you can hear it. I can't hear it anymore, but I used to when I was with her. But she's something I lost too. It hurts too much to think about it, like there's a black hole I was born with pulling me in. She had soft blonde hair, so soft, like the wing of a bird. I was a child again in her arms. I hit, I hit, I hit her. I hit her so hard and I hated myself. I could never forgive myself. I left him in the fields. I drink, I push it down. There is no way back. When I was in the jungle, 
I pressed her picture to my heart, my feet rotting in those boots in that deep black mud, and I ran and shot. I killed so many people. They were everywhere, and they were everything. They filled up the sky. Byron was ahead of me. He was always leading. He was Ojibwe, and he was my best friend. He looked behind to see if I'd fallen, because I did once, and that's when the explosions came. They came out of the ground as if something great and wide had opened up to eat us all. And I ran. I ran. I ran, and Byron died. There is no way back. On the screen, I feel like I redeem myself, forget myself. I am beautiful. And the women who follow me because of it, giving me beautiful, pure white things to snort and sweet, sparkling things to drink, understand? When I finally feel like I am underwater and floating and laughing, they all look like her. They never look like Byron or my mother. I couldn't live through that. There is no way back. Everything is a story, a dream, don't you think? I do. I can see it all from here. The great red plains of Oklahoma calling me like a song, like a bird's wing, like my mother calling me in Cherokee. Byron is still alive. He lives in Minneapolis. My mother and father are proud of me, and they are still alive. She is still my lover. I live a life inside this cocoon of white and sparkling things. I drive around in a shiny, lovely thing, a thing that is like a panther that the women who love me are riding. I just have to keep pushing it all down until I crash. There is no way back. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, and thank all of you for giving us a sample of your work this evening. I think um, if uh, people want to pick up your work, uh, just ask their independent bookseller, right? If you're in Longmont, that means barbed wire books. If you're in Denver, that means the tattered cover, yeah? Book bar, too. Yeah? Yeah. And if you're in Boulder, Boulder Bookstore, I suppose. Um, Erica, my first question is for you, and this this... This came up in our kind of conversation before the program. Um, you made a point of reminding me that while our current reality may seem shocking to people like me, um, it's been difficult, if not miserably bizarre, for black, indigenous, and people of color in the US for pretty much since the get-go. Um, do you think now is, it seemed important to, to recall that? Um, do you think now is some sort of reckoning or karmic comeuppance, or was is this inev an inevitable kind of uh, facing of reality in a way that's unparalleled? Or you know, I, 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 there, there is a writer who's a friend of mine, and someone was saying she had written something that went against traditional values, and this is why the coronavirus was rampant on someone's reservation and I was so uncomfortable with that interpretation so I you know I'm uncomfortable with that interpretation in general however I do think a lot about how obviously you know when you're talking about America we're everywhere but we're kind of like nowhere in people's consciousnesses you know um, and, it, and that's really because of genocide, and that's really because of disease and the way in which um, people would like spread smallpox very purposefully once they realize like, well, these people don't get how bad this is. So when I think about, you know, um, things like this, that is the first place my mind goes to. I, I, and so I do think about how like this is a country based on slavery and genocide, but I don't, I can't really think of it as a reckon um, a reckoning, but I will say that there's no way around it if you continue, like even if the country's project was super positive in certain ways and starts to get better in little tiny ways and bits and pieces, if you largely have a country that continues to perpetuate violence even against its own most, you know, average citizens, how are you not going to end up with something like this? Because you have, for example, a president that was elected because people were afraid of the brown people. <laughs> I mean, that's really it. And this is a president who's willing to sacrifice citizens, you know, for every capitalistic reason that, that he has. He doesn't care. 
And so that lack of empathy, I guess, is part of our, our lineage as a country, if, if I were to put it that way. But it, it's, there is a reaction to this extreme lack of empathy that you're talking about. Um, it's, almost, it's almost providing this kind of contrast for people to, uh, to that, that's kind of activating people in a way that they haven't been, or opening people's eyes in a way that they haven't been opened before, it seems like to me. I, I hope so. I think the problem is like when we say people, oftentimes the default is white people, right? And that's yeah. part of the whole, sure. you know, but I think white folks, I do, I did read, for example, that like if it, it was something like five years ago, they surve surveyed um, white folks, whoever participated, whatever the survey was, and they said, do you think police violence is worse towards people of color? And the percentages were like fairly low. In other words, like largely, no, no, it's not. Now it's something like over 60% are like, yeah, obviously. So there is that. Yeah. You know, it's occurred to me that this incredible disruption of our daily lives that's been brought on by COVID and the lockdown, it's almost acted as this, this massive disruption or crack in our sort of collective consciousness, allowing for a sort of upwelling of aspects of our society. We've collectively repressed or something. Um, and this kind of reminds me a little bit of, of a certain Mr. Hyde. <laughs> would, would you care to reflect, that, reflect on that a little bit? Um, Daniel's written a fabulous book that's all about uh, the Hyde of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, in the context of Jekyll and Hyde, uh, in this Victorian setting, Hyde was the, you know, embodiment of all of this um, moralistic uh, repression that was embodied by that, that culture, which was kind of deeply hypocritical and repressive and suppressive and um, and yet depraved, you know, outside of the, the respectable spotlight. Um, so, you know, what is, what is that correlation now? Like, what is, what is the hide of our society? Um, I mean, it's interesting, you know, uh, going off your comment, in particular, the idea of this reckoning, you know, that what is happening to us is somehow deserved on a karmic level. Um, and when you say us? When I say, yeah, when I, that's a good point. Um, I think I probably mean um, like Western, globalized, commercialized, capitalistic culture that is like destroying the planet and, and has produced, I think, kind of the most monstrous version of that kind of value and that success in our present. Um, so, you know, I guess the interesting question is like, do we, meaning, meaning that culture, do we deserve this in some sense? Have we asked for this? Have we, or have we called it forth in the way that Jekyll kind of calls forth Hyde? Um, and I definitely find myself thinking that, you know, this, the, the, the topic of the stranger than fiction, the, the, the sequence of events that keeps happening is just so unrelenting. It reminds one of the way that <clears throat> fiction should be constructed, which is that it, you need to keep upping the ante, you need to keep raising the stakes. And you start a book, and, and you actually turned me on to this book. You mentioned the, um, the Leave the World Behind, which is a National Book Award nominee. Um, which I read uh, since you recommended it because it caught my attention. So a, a book starts with a, a comfortable uh, elitist or at least kind of entitled um, self-absorbed family in a car going to holiday in a, at a rented place in the Hamptons. Like this isn't going to go well for this family. Like fiction <laughs> demands that this family get their comeuppance in some sense, if only for being comfortable and happy or not even appreciating their happiness or what they have, their entitlement in the beginning of the story. 
All right, so if like the beginning of the story is just everything that's been leading up to now, which you know, in the context of this metaphor, like I don't know, do, how, does this this these sequence of terrible things happening to us is this in a fanciful way kind of the universe's version of of a fictional comeuppance of um, of what we as this kind of destructive culture deserve. Can I that's speak a great to that? question. Can I speak to that a little bit? Because I think that's like our bread and butter as writers, right? Like, you know, you reap what you sow and there, you know, stories came from cautionary tales and fairy tales and all those idea so I think it's really in us uh, in a literary way to feel that whatever happens is a result of something we've laid down either on purpose or inadvertently and um, and as writers it's it's, uh, it's our tendency to, to feel like what what did I do and how did what were all the events leading up to this that nothing happens in isolation uh, Erica you're you're saying no 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 I was just thinking about I, I didn't want to cut you off though with my like <laughs> <laughs> it was it was charming <laughs> um yeah i was teaching um a, a class like over zoom and it happened to have like um some native students in it and we were talking about for whatever reason the portrait of of you know environmentalism that's generally western and the one that's native american and it's not as simplistic as i think people think I think people are like well indians love nature we did do bad things too, you know, I mean, we were human, but I will say this, that um, a lot of times I hear, you know, this repeated just on social media and it's a general idea, really, if you think about it, it's a very old European idea that like um, human beings are on top. And, and even though I think they'll say, oh no, I don't believe in that, they'll still say, well, human beings are a virus to this earth. That would be like an insane way of thinking. That would be like I, I, unthinkable, I think, for a lot of different native traditions. The idea is more like the relationship has suffered and it's out of balance. And so the relationship between nature and human beings, first of all, isn't separable, but we've, we've, we've put it out of harmony. It has to be rebalanced. And that's the way a lot of native people will talk about this thing. And so I think, in a way, too, what I was thinking about was that, like, um, what, what the problem with being, like, middle class, even, and I certainly am, like, comfortable in certain ways, is not just that you deserve what you get or you, there's some re reckoning or, or reestablishment of balance, but just you can't recognize what's natural. I mean, pandemic, the way we could have done lots of things to stop suffering, obviously, and maybe that's our inheritance as a country, but death is natural and I was teaching Richard Lange's essay called of human carnage and every year and I have to admit it's the same with me in this this essay in my comp class the students react the same way which is so powerfully to this essay which finally Lange has to say I saw this incredibly violent thing happen in front of me it screwed me up for a long time but the only thing that made me realize in the end like I'm gonna be okay is death is natural and this is this, and so I think that's some of the problems that all of us are kind of a little insulated from the idea of what's natural. You know, is your work? Is there something about your work that's that is is is, is part of your work about rebalancing things? Do you think? No, a bit? no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's a thing. Like, I I'm much more interested in. Um, I mean, because like we're talking about, like that's how fiction's built. And so I'm much more interested in characters like this guy who it's not possible. And you know, it's, it's arguable that perhaps he's assimilated or he's colonized, that's probably true. Um, and I don't wanna argue for some like wonderful Edenistic Native America that, like, that we can never get back to because that, that doesn't leave Native people with just a human place to stand. But if, if I am arguing for balance, it's only because like I'm showing how out of balance people are maybe, I don't know. Right, right. And it's that demonstration of the imbalance that might lead to some rebalancing, perhaps, who knows. 
anyway. Um, how would you say that um, all of these calamities upon calamities have been affecting your own, your own practice now? As, <laughs> as writers, I mean, I, I, I yeah. Are, are you just home, like in bed watching Netflix all day? No, I, no. <laughs> no, I wish. No, I think it's put a lot of, um, I, you know, not to get too personal, but I think it's put a lot of um, financial and time constraints on writers. Uh, you know, I, I get a little impatient when I see people baking things on <laughs> yeah. Facebook because I'm like, what's that? And, yeah. like, you know, I'm sitting, like, eating cereal at 2 in the morning trying to, um, you know, make extra money so we can, you know, stay in our home. So it's it's been hard. It's been, um, I think, hard. But it's also felt, it, it's both felt like, what am I even doing this for? And it's also felt more necessary in a weird way for me anyway. It's proven to me like, no, I'm in this, you know, because every now and then, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but like I'll flirt with like, maybe I should just work in a gas station, you know, that, that sounds like a nice life, you know, <laughs> just, you know, buy, you know, just bring up people's cigarettes and things. But, um, but I think when you're tested in this kind of way, you realize like, no, I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> for all it's good and ill um so it is it is a like trial by fire for me anyway i don't know what do you guys think i definitely don't understand why i quit smoking <laughs> oh god yes. especially yeah. now well, i was like, fantasizing <laughs> about smoking yesterday <laughs> yep, and i haven't no. smoked in like eight years isn't that it, funny and then oof. it'll be like right back at you <laughs> well yeah no it would be it would be awful I know. The worst. no it's great it'll kill you but we might die anyway that's my whole thing anyway put it on daniel thoughts um, <laughs> you know, I said I was working on a, uh, a, a sci-fi book, um, and it's about, you know, it's about climate change and about the rise of AI and sort of the inevitable human, uh, extinction and savior by this kind of figure who puts people in domes and then kind of genetically engineers the ideal sort of human qualities that might lead to a, a genuinely like progressive human race that could coexist with the planet and live in the future. So I've been writing this thing. And I think in the beginning of, of, of the pandemic, I was like, man, I'm doing great. Like all these writers are like, I feel like I'm talking to people and they're struggling and like, I feel so, I have so much time and I have like, and then, and then I took a break from it. I got married. I went back to New Jersey. I went home. I stayed in a creepy Airbnb with my wife. That led to the story. <laughs> um, and I wrote another story that was kind of like this. It was sort of biographical and very like contemporary. And suddenly, like the world of my sci-fi book started to seem very remote and theoretical and sort of like these were these were ideas that didn't even seem relevant. Like they had seemed relevant to the world that we were living in, but then now it's like, what? Like I'm writing about, even writing about AI and, and uh, you know, I had some like speculative elements. So I've been trying to find my way back to the novel, but I think what's interesting is that I'm one finding that my focus uh, in terms of perspective is narrowing um, on the characters and I'm trying to rather than like accessing these grand themes that I think I was after in, in the draft leading up to this um, I'm trying to access my own outrage and anger and fear and feeling like we're at war and giving that to the characters. And so I'm finding the approach is much more individualistic and sort of immediately emotive for what I'm going through rather than trying to write this thing that was kind of this idea of what would be hot right now or what would mm -hmm. be topical. Yeah, you know, this is stuff I think a lot about. My mom was a, um, a dancer, she owned a little dance studio and my dad and she got out of like a lot of poverty. My dad. His wife was um, sent to Ireland, and he was an aerospace engineer. And so when I was a kid, I was a 
gracious reader has only read speculative literature. I've probably read chocolates to kill my conversation. And someone had gave me a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Did I tell you this ridiculous anecdote? And I was like, <laughs> where are the dragons? What, <laughs> what, what is the point of this book? You know. And then I got to college, and I took literature courses, and my parents were happy about it, and I did it anyway. And um, I really fell in love with what I like to call realism, realism instead of literary, right? Because in a way, those, those things can be applied, like things I think, like depth of characterization, depth of theme. You know, they can be applied to cops and spaceships too. But I think um, I'm somebody who has moved further and further away from it. Like I, I started writing poetry. <laughs> That's gone. <laughs> and so gone. And then I started writing very realistic novels. The last one was about native gangs, and no one wanted to read that. And um, now I'm kind of moving further and further towards speculative, but I think the one thing that I can say is that that's not a bad process, right? Because we kind of need both. Like, in order to imagine ourselves out of this, and like literally a lot of what NASA uses was one speculative literature. They were reading Heinlein they, were, Heinlein, they were reading all of these people and their brains started to go on fire and they started to come up with solutions to things. But we also need that human element. We need like that character we can connect with in the dome. You know, so I, that's, I mean, to me, it just sounds like you're kind of going through the fire and making it better, you know. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks. So do you think you guys can help, can, you guys can kind of write us out of this, <laughs> do you think, maybe? Huh. <laughs> yeah. Seriously? No. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. Definitely not. Well, what I mean, let's let's talk about the kind of future you might imagine. For Hopefully us. not domes. I will say that scares me. Well, that's a, living that's in sad. domes. Yeah. Living, living in, in domes. domes. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's not do that. Yeah. I think another um, problem with trying to write during this time is that uh, it's it is beyond imagination. After Trump's election, I was like. My my antagonist is weak, you know, because this guy on TV is far greater than anything I could ever imagine as far as malice. And then um, and it's really hard to write, you know, to honestly, it's really hard to write to the level of what we're doing right now as far as, you know, you need your strong antagonist. And um, and it's such, a, you know, what we've got for leadership is such a caricature that it just sets you up like, okay, do I want to write satire? I don't want to write satire. You know, I don't, I don't personally want to write satire. Satire is great, but like, you know, how would I meet what's happening now? You know, even imaginatively, and I can't, I can't think of a way. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like the death of subtlety, and subtlety is something that <clears throat> I think fiction writers really rely on being able to use. So. As for whether or not I could I could write my way out of this situation and come up with any solution, the answer is absolutely not. I, it's actually, you know, it is stranger than fiction, and, and it calls into question like what fiction can. It it makes me wonder what the future is after this point for fiction. I don't and I don't know the answer. You know, it's interesting. One of my former students, she has a two book deal, and it became like this completely different um, book that she wrote. But the book that I had worked on with her with her thesis, it's never stopped giving me the chills. And now even more than ever because it was called Evercotton. And it was about how after the election, slavery was reinstituted and black folks, all of their, um, they were, everything of theirs was, you know, absorbed by the government and redistributed to white folks. And everybody who was white became wealthy. And then on top of it, um, there was a cotton that was genetically engineered to just like it could like the minute you picked it it would be it would regenerate and i honestly am like please please juliana re, you know come back to that manuscript because now that to me does seem relevant and that's speculative right but it's it's so close to reality and it's so like it i i i think that i think it is i think speculative in ways has become more um because Everyone, like I think a lot of writers of color were talking about this, that like if bad things have happened to you, you kind of wait for the worst thing. And so a lot of us are like, I knew it, you know, somehow, even with Trump being elected, I knew it. I woke up three nights in a row when he was nominated. I just knew it. So I was living in the rural Midwest. I knew it. So I think like now 
it almost feels like, yeah, this is, this is where thought was going to happen. And then I'm like, oh, God, oh, no. But I have the luxury of feeling that way only because my job has been fairly stable, too. So I don't know. I, I think fiction um, has, I think stories, you know, have always been and they will, as long as we survive, they will survive. But, yeah, they're going to have to morph around us and we're going to change, you know. So. I mean, I think there's this, I don't know if it's an illusion or just a desire that, uh, fiction can be cautionary enough that it will change behavior or make people better. I I don't I don't I don't think that's the case. And I I think it provides an escape. And the people who read books who are interested and curious and intelligent are probably already on our side anyway. You know, those are necessarily the people who need to be changed. I mean, in terms of, well, that's not true at all. Everyone needs to change. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we all need to change. Um, but, I mean, as to your question, I was, um, I was just playing out a scenario with my friend. It, when I was writing these short stories, I was like, I want to write like a, a civil war story, like a second, like what, what, hap what would it take to actually get us into a, a, a civil war scenario? And how would that break down? And what would that look like? And we kind of like, going off what I said earlier in the sense that like, okay, like let's keep playing out these, these steps from a, from a writer's perspective. Uh, and you know, you can play it out. Like the election is inconclusive and Trump sticks around and then he starts rallying the, the troops at the, and then, I don't know, ICE is militarized and like, what would it take until we, until, and then there's attacks on liberal areas like Boulder and then there's militia rolling through town and your registration, you know, your voter registration is known and are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? And blah, blah, blah. Like, that can get scary very quickly. Um, <laughs> and oh, I'm scared. I f there's definitely this desire to believe that if Biden wins, everything is going to be fine. Uh, I'm not so convinced about that scenario either. <laughs> It seems like there's a, a large percentage of people who feel the other way, too, right? Yeah. If Trump gets reelected, we'll all be fine. Yeah. Oh, it's a cr crazy days, it seems like. I will say, I did read that um, as to literature changing people, right? That, you know, it's always as hairy, but they did do like the neurological experiments and they would put on, um, you know, what are they called? The little hats on people's <laughs> heads. <laughs> Clearly, I have a ways to go Electrodes before I my speculative maybe? chops, right? I think they're called um, brainy hats. Brainy, oh, brainy hats. hats. Brain hats. <clears throat> brainy hats. Thank you. Yeah. And um, when, they, it, it, when they're when they experiencing something and when they're reading experiencing the same thing, it registers the same way. And over time, fiction specifically does help people to develop empathy. Mm. Mm. So... Not nonfiction. Screw that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Erica. I don't know. Like, it's for fiction. <laughs> You're like, it's fine. <laughs> what are you guys reading right now? What, do you, what are you hungering for? What kind of narratives are you drawn to? Well, <laughs> I'm reading things in translation. On, I think I, I, need, um, I need distance, you uh -huh. know, so I'm reading... Uh, works that are translated into English from Japanese or Russian. So that, for me, is, I don't know. I, I think there is something to be said for that reading for escape idea. You know, I think that, I think a lot of us do that, especially in hard times. And somehow, like, even removing myself from my country, my language is helping me. <laughs> How about you guys? I've been, I get in these really finicky moods where I'm like, I want something that's just like this. <laughs> uh, and often it's, or recently it's been like, I want literary fiction as in it's, it's well written and there's a great deal of attention paid to craft, but it's still, it has a genre orientation. It's, it's a, it's a propelling story. There's maybe either a thriller or a, maybe a sci-fi or a speculative element, um, which is why I went and read that Leave the World Behind when you mentioned it, um, that uh, Raman Alam, uh, which was, I thought, a 
pretty wonderful book. I, it wasn't a perfect book, but it was, it was a pretty damn good book. Um, and then I don't know. I found my like, I I was uh, the fires forced me out of my uh, house recently, um, and so we were. I was up at my sister's sister in law's house in the mountains, and I'd like finished that book, and I was just like, oh, I, need, I need something. And then I pulled the magicians off the off the oh, shelf. Yes. And I listened to it on audio years ago and loved it, but it's very different to listen to something and read it. And I started reading, and immediately I was like, oh, <laughs> this is what I want. <laughs> Love is a friend of mine, and let me tell you something. He is really what flipped me. Like he, the magicians did it. Like yeah. that's what it was because it was probably already happening anyway. That and rewatching, like starting to watch Doctor Who again. I'd pretty much been like just realism on literary because I wanted to be, you know, as you know, this mixed young kid um, who wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be taken seriously. And if I were honest with myself, I wanted to be in the Norton Anthology of British Literature. And when I realized <laughs> that would not happen, um, that, that started the processes up. Um, but one of my friends had said, you need to read this book. And now I know part of why Loves has this literary quality because as much as he's still angry at them for various reasons his parents were like scholars and poets and his dad um, was a poet who won many awards and he tried to kind of like not disappoint them and then he was like I love Narnia you know and so <laughs> you know he wrote the magicians and that whole series and I just adore that to pieces Mexican gothic if Ramon Alam is like the speculative edge but on the super literary side and not very propulsive from what I understand um, Mexican Gothic is like right on the other side. Smart, but like if this one's literary and this one's commercial, this, but they're kind of like two halves of the same because they both have like depth of theme and great characterization, but this one's really propulsive and it's smart in a super co covert way. I love Mexican Gothic. And my friend, uh, Rebecca Roanhorse, I'm reading her Black Sun, which is this fantasy world based on mind mythology. And it's really, as usual, like the world she creates is so alternative and so different and so brilliant and intricate. And um, so those are two fabulous books that are technically escapist, but really pretty brilliant in their way. And what they're saying is really brilliant in the end, even if it's like smartly commercial in the way it's pa they're both paced and worlded, you know. So. And who's Mexican Gothic by? Um, her name is Sylvia Go Moreno Garcia. Yeah, she's, and I just, I love that book. You know, I was drawn to uh, putting this program together because I was trying to figure out who would, who could have possibly written this, this time that we're in. Um, and, I, you know, I thought, oh, is it, is it Vonnegut? No. Um, is it, is it sort of some Joseph Heller? Is it, <laughs> is it Gore Vidal or, you know, what, who, do you, who do you think could write the next chapter of this? I mean, who is this crazy novelist who's written this story for us? Totally Game of Thrones, dude. It's Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because the right. other guys aren't violent enough. You know, Game of Thrones, dude, is just killing people left and right. You know, so I think it's him. I would maybe say like Margaret Atwood. Oh, oh yeah. Margaret yeah. Atwood. Yeah, mm. that's mm -hmm. good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna second Margaret Atwood. Oh, okay, I would, right. I would like to see her do that. Yeah. I wonder what she's doing right now, actually. Yeah, to, like, deal Margaret. With I'm Margaret, sure she's like, well, I'm gonna throw away this manuscript because you know <laughs> <laughs> it already came true. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, if you happen upon this on Facebook, uh, please leave <laughs> something in the comments, will you? <laughs> Put in the chat. <laughs> well, I'd I'd like to turn to Q and A, but you know, I think that. Um, uh, President Trump and Vice President Biden are stealing our thunder this evening. Not a lot of action on Facebook. <laughs> um, and our socially distanced audience is rather slim this evening. Um, if anyone is inspired to ask a question from our little audience or even of each other here on the stage. Um, I can ask a question. I'm just wondering how you guys like how COVID has changed your um, your writing routine and how you compensate, like what you do on a daily basis that's different from what you did before you know, March? It, it doesn't, it hasn't changed so much. I was teaching online before this hit anyway. I was, I've been teaching at CU online and 
And well, I, I mean, I, you know, I was teaching at Lighthouse too, so that was a transition. So now we're doing Zoom classes, but um, it hasn't. Ch you know, the ru the routine is just get up in the morning, write for a few hours. Um, I mean, a, a great day. You know, I, I'll get up, write for a few hours, have a little lunch, write for a few more hours, then turn my attention to like schoolwork and everything else. Um, I don't think it's changed the routine. It's it's I have more days where I, those terrible days when you go and look what you've written and you're like, this is garbage. <laughs> this is like I don't know how to do this. Clearly, like this is, and then just you know the, the breakdown by nine thirty a.m. like getting back in bed and like I can't do this. I'm never <laughs> going to finish this. And then needing a little like buck up and then you're like all right all right I'll get back to it. So I have, I have more days like that. I wouldn't say it's changed the the routine, but certainly like the emotional consistency is a little more all over the place, maybe. That makes sense, yeah. And and like Daniel, I'm I uh, I fought for I'm in, as my as you noted my bio. Um, I have a um, job at Western Illinois University, even though I'm from here, and I fought for an online schedule. And I've you know for the foreseeable future, I have it, and I really have it now. <laughs> because everyone has it. And so um, in some ways, and, and this is a real hell semester too, because I have five classes. I took an extra on, and we, we were at a 3-3, but then they were like, long story short, but before COVID, we had budget issues because we had a crazy Tea Party governor. And so we had to fire all of our lecturers because we're unionized. We don't have adjuncts, we have lecturers, and they're all, almost all gone. And so we had to take on extra classes, and I took on another one because the chair was freaking out, and then I teach two next semester. So anyway. And I just had other various projects, just projects, 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 like all kinds of things, like I was losing my mind, and I still am. And, I'm, and I burned down my current novel again for the fourth time and rewrote it. <laughs> I, you know, bur I mean, burned it down to maybe 10% of what it was for the fourth time because I'm horrible at structure and I'm trying to get better at that. That's really my problem. Um, but I do, I feel like the terror of the um, pandemic has subsided to some degree or another, but every once in a while I realize like, oh no, I could still die, and people I know have died, and more could, and my mom is 80, you know, and so, and then Trump didn't die, sorry. <laughs> and so, you know, um, or, and Trump might win, and so th those things start to come back, and, and they probably, I probably have that same kind of like, if I'm honest with myself, more consistent freak out, or because of that, yeah. <laughs> I was trying, I'm trying to find a Facebook question. Right now. I have a question. We have a real oh, question. Hey, yes, we do have a question. Uh, hello, authors. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> David. Back from the mic a little bit. Um, thank you all for a stimulating discussion tonight. Here's my question for you in the time we have left. Do you think, so I'm David Hesco Wombly Wyden, and I've been promoting a book, uh, Winter Counts, for the last two months, and I've done many, many Zoom events. Now, Erica, you have a, a book coming out, Erica Kay. Do you think that the book industry, will we go back to having book tours and in-person events? How do you think that's going to change? Because all I've ever known is Zoom events and such. Do you think we'll ever go back or is it forever changed? And that's for everyone up there. I, yeah, it's anyone's guess, but I think, um, you know, I actually talked to my agent about it because I was like, I don't want it, you know, I don't want this to come out during the pandemic and um, luckily everyone's backed up so much it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be like um 20 end of 2022 for me or, or early 2023 um because they're just all backed up from covid uh, so i was saying you know uh, please please not during covid and she's like and she said i you think things are going to go back to normal they're not we're we're just going to learn a new way of doing things and she said look at how people buy books now they don't go to bookstores like they used to, they go online and they find the cheapest price and they get it, you know, shipped to their door. So she said it's, she bel believed that we're just going to have to find a new normal, um, which will be more virtual. And I know some authors have already done that. Like they, you know, they'll do the like virtual book clubs and they'll visit, you know, via, um, it used to be Skype and now it's Zoom, right? So I think that's been ha happening for a while. Um, that said, there were those, have been those big, you know, celebrity author events where they get paid like 20 grand and they show up somewhere and they, you know, 
they kind of like, you know, and it's a big auditorium and we've seen those and done those with, with Lighthouse. So that's the one thing I kind of wonder, like, is that dead? You know, um, I, I don't know. I, it, it's going to be a while before people want to breathe around each other, you know, in, in many places. You know, some places they don't care, but I, that's one thing I, I, I do. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I think we're going to be starved for that, you know, in-person experience. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully people will be, you know, m perhaps we'll come out of this with people going to their local bookstore to buy books more than buying them off Amazon. I don't know. That is uh, my my handsome boyfriend asked that question. And his <laughs> novel, Winter Counts, is brilliant. I know I'm biased, but it's a literary crime novel. It's fabulous, um, set on the Rosebud Res. I, Dave and I were talking about this the other day, and I, at Western, we run a writing series, and we have, like, a large grant, and, you know, I, I have said many times that, look, you know, me being able to teach online, I think that academics need to be less in the current, even the post-pandemic current economic situation we have. I, I spent, you know, over a decade, my entire 30s, stuck in a tiny town um, really in hell, hoping to God one of the agents I would acquire would, oh, maybe this one will sell it to the big press and I'll get out of here. And it never happened. And that was painful. It took things from me, even though I'm, of course, I'm grateful to have a job, which people remind me, we should be grateful to have a job. <laughs> and I'm like, I am. But I also lost things. And um, so part of me wants to be like, hey, you know what? Let, let people teach on Zoom so they can be with their partners. Stop making it such a fight. But yeah, I hope that some things, I'd like to see a new norm in which we have a more chosen face-to-face -face culture. Like I do, a, I, for a, for a, a mid-list Native American writer, <laughs> um, I do okay. Um, and so I do, a, I, I used to travel quite a bit for readings and now I mainly do it over Zoom. And I still admit I love to travel and I love to do it. But there were people who expected me to do it for $200. And what I have learned is like, Y'all, if you don't have the money, that's totally okay. But I am, I can do Zoom for two hundred dollars. You know what I mean? So, um, but thanks for being right. here, Erica. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, I can drive. Yeah, to, you can drive. Well, yeah, you you're know, not, I'm not like you're not flying, flying across the country. Arkansas, that's right. right? <laughs> so. We can put you up tonight, though, if you need it. Thanks. Yeah, we'll find a place. <laughs> I, you know, I used to uh, produce a, a literary series in L.A. for a long time, and I know that, I, and it was really dependent upon uh, book tours, right, authors on book tours, and I know that they've been cutting back on that for quite a while, and, you know, publishers are always trying to save money, and, and then so many people, so many authors are tied to speaker bureaus, and it's, or the big ones are at least, and you know, where you used to be able to get someone for free, they were starting to charge folks. And I, I unfortunately, I, I think that when we come out of this, the whole book tour thing is probably going to take a pretty big hit, I would think, unfortunately. I don't think that's a bad thing. I always thought it was kind of, I don't know, a little bit BS for an author to charge so much money so they could promote their own work. <laughs> Like, just show up, you know, just show up and do it. And because it's all for you, you know, but, um, th and I, I do understand that, like, people don't have time to do, you know, their time is worth a lot. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that would be okay with me, honestly, if people just, if the big ticket um, book tour thing went away and writers just decided to make themselves more available for what's in their own best interest. Instead I just don't know if publishers are going to be sending people out like they used to. That's the thing. Oh, they already right. stopped doing yeah, that. Right. Yeah. 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 That's it, all like privately done, you know what I mean? Like the speakers and yeah. I mean, I just wonder too how much longer we're going to keep making physical books, which is kind of devastating. I I I love my books. I like real real things. I don't And I, that that has a shelf life for sure. Like um, and so probably this increasing movement toward virtualization, which humanity seems kind of progressing into anyway, is certainly going to extend to that. There's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of grief in the loss of this, like the sexiness of the vision of being a writer. You know, <laughs> like all of that, like the, the, 
all of this that we're talking about, the big book tours, the, the idea that you're going to get there one day, that you're going to be one of those, those big people. And, but there's a lot of ego in that too, you know? So, I mean, there's part of this process is like, what can I pare away and just get down to being at the desk and like enjoying it, which is hard some days, but that's all there is. Like everything else is, well, it, you know, it's, it's unguaranteed and it's fleeting and it's, it's not necessarily even going to satisfy you if like the daily work doesn't. I think though that for me, I just wanted to be in a, like a town where there was a Thai restaurant. I mean, I never wanted to be <laughs> Tommy Orange. That sounds honestly kind of terrible. Um, you know, and Alexi was obviously a monster. That's, he was a bit of one and then he became one. <clears throat> and there's a super tier, like I, because I've been doing, because we have a good um, foundation ground at Western, I know exactly what people cost now. Like I know exactly what they cost. And so you're right, there's this kind of creepy tiered class system to it. But I think there are ways to have better new normals like I don't I think the book as a fetish object will will come into being like beautiful hardback beautiful books and then like Spotify we have you know what I mean like our ebooks are Spotify and then when we love something we'll get a beautiful fetish object and put that on the shelf I know? think you know books if you look at a book it's like ecologically so sound it's they never go away we don't we don't read them and throw them away no one throws away books so they go from us to our little libraries and our goodwills and they go somewhere else and you know so it's like and it gets passed from person to person so and I have books that are you know easily 100 years old on my shelf not cuz I collect them I mean they're falling apart but they're um just they just got passed down that way so if you if you I think just given our um, our bent toward, you know, the objects that we do keep, I think books. I don't know. I have to believe that paper books will be will be there. They've 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 stuck around this far. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And they smell agree. good. We do have a <laughs> um, a question from Carl on Facebook. He said he's asking, what is the proper distance of dystopian fiction from the world? It shouldn't be too on the nose. What do you think? Yeah, that seems more like Daniel's question, but it I does, will say, it? you know, I've thought a lot about this because I got really tired of dystopia fiction, like dystopic fiction. I was like, you know, instead of imagining the world as a destruction, like over and over again. So I was, I was writing this big science fiction novel about another world that was sort of Mayan inspired, actually, where these these gigantic red people. It's this idea that like if the mines had never been interrupted by the environment and then colonization, would they be far advanced? Um, and then this communication with a girl who worked at SETI. But, you know, the problem with dystopia is that why people like it so much is because obviously it's, it's becoming realer and realer. So really it seems like, I mean, the, the speculative reality is absolutely coming to meet our reality reality and people want to read more about it. Like dystopia is more popular than ever, wouldn't you say as a... Yeah, oh yeah. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question of like, how does it need to be distorted? Um, I don't know. I mean, I ran into that when I was writing these short stories and I was in the middle of one that was again, very like kind of autobiographical. And eventually I was just like, this is too like real. This is too, <laughs> like I'm trying to write my life or this aspect of my life into a story. Um, and then maybe I, there's a relief of going back to the, uh, abstraction of the other world, but um, yeah, there, I mean, there's it, it, it's an interesting question. Like, do you need to skew it somehow? Is there an inherent satisfaction in reading something that's like, okay, this is a dystopia. It's not our world, world, but as it goes along, there's a sense of oh, okay, these like the either there's a thematic echo or there's just this kind of this sense that this is an alternate version of what might have been. I, I don't think anything can not, or I don't think anything can not work. Like anything right, can work. Right, 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 yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's getting to be about that time. Let me just check. This is the great thing about doing Q&A on Facebook is that I can just call up Facebook here on my phone. And... Uh, Someone says they like the filming. 
Yeah, the authors Way to go, film not good yeah. The event itself. They suck. Yeah. <laughs> the camera was great. The, the filming's good. The content. Mm. Yeah. No, you, you guys have been great, and uh, thanks for being good sports with my my. I, I felt like my my topic this evening was a little was a little silly to begin with, but I I, I feel like we turned it into a good good meditation. Um, Thank you, Justin, and thanks to the Longmont Museum, and thanks for having us here. These are some of my favorite people, so it's well, nice to hang out. You're with some us. of our new f most favorite people here <laughs> in Longmont, and you guys are welcome back here any old time, and I hope you well, come you back Rosario's. again and again and again. We have a Thai restaurant. Oh, boy. So you may want to just stay here. <laughs> I might. Yeah. No, for free, too. <laughs> for free. Yeah, well, there's a lot of free... Free housing here. That's not actually, that's not true. Like anyway, <laughs> on behalf of the Longmont Museum and the city of Longmont and the people of Longmont, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, we'll see you next week for our 100th anniversary of women's suffrage panel led by the May, great Maeve Conran of KGNU. Um, signing off, see you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.